Okay, this is the, the third video for artificial intelligence, and I'm going to start now talking about the simplest um, bunch of AI algorithms, which is um, the collection of algorithms that you can use to do problem solving by, by, by search. Now this, I think, initially should, I hope, look very familiar to you. Um, we want to model the uh, situation where an agent is in an environment that can be described in terms of states, and where by taking an action in a state, it could move to a new state. And it's trying to find a sequence of actions um, that will get it to its goal. So we identify some state as being um, the initial state, which is the one that the agent begins in. We model actions by using a function uh, called action that takes an action and the current state and gives us the new state that results from performing the action. And we need a way of knowing whether we've got to a goal, and that just corresponds to a function called goal that takes a state and identifies it as being a goal state or not a goal state. Now we sometimes want to be a little bit more subtle than just finding a sequence of actions. We may want to identify um, costs um, that are attached to performing actions under specific circumstances. Um, we model that using a function called cost um, that just tells us how much it costs to do an action in a particular state. Once we've got that idea, if we start in the initial state and we take some actions, then we get a path which is just a sequence of states um, that the agent will move through by performing those actions. And we can assign a cost to that path, which is just the sum of the costs of doing the individual actions in their respective states. Often we want to get some kind of optimal solution, which in this context just means we want to find the path from S0, the initial state, to some state that is, is a goal, um, and that has the minimum possible cost. Now I'm really hoping that you've already seen um, some problems that are very much like this. In Foundations of Computer Science, uh, you will have seen during the lectures um, the ideas of depth-first, breadth-first and iterative deepening search within trees. And hopefully you also did a lot of old exam questions for Foundations of Computer Science and got some practice at programming, this kind of thing. In the algorithms course, uh, you have already seen depth-first and breadth-first search applied to searching in graphs. Um, the perspective is a little bit more formal than foundations of computer science, uh, but nonetheless, these are essentially the same kinds of problem. But the key point that we need to start with is that these specific algorithms, depth-first, breadth-first, and iterative deepening search, aren't really effective in real AI um, circumstances. Whenever you apply um, something like this to an, a proper AI problem, you will inevitably be applying it in a situation where you can potentially have an awful lot of states and an awful lot of actions in each state. That means that you have an exponential time problem. We'll come on to that in a moment. And as a result, these algorithms will take either far too long or require far too much memory. And in fact, it's the latter that tends to be the problem in practice. And so we need much more sensible ways of attacking these kinds of problems. And that's the new material that we're about to work up to. Now, the real key point is that when you've seen these algorithms um, so far, there hasn't been an awful lot said about precisely how you choose the next action to try. In depth-first and breadth-first search, sure, there is an ordering um, that defines which of those searches you get, um, but we can often do an awful lot better than that. Um, and iterative deepening is then built on top of depth-first search, um, but we can use uh, that idea um, in more interesting ways in order to get where we want to go. This is a really simple example of the kind of AI problem that we might want to solve. 
yes, it's a it's a trivial toy problem. Um, having said that, I can remember uh, getting one of these for Christmas. Um, that was Christmas uh, when I was a kid, um, before we got the ZX81s to play with. Um, the idea here is that you have a little plastic game with some sliding tiles, and the idea is to slide uh, a tile into the empty space, um, and by doing this, to move the tiles around in such a way that you get to a goal state. This is a very simple AI problem. Um, in fact, if you use bigger versions of this game, uh, even just a 5x5 five five grid, um, gives you quite a big search space and uh, quite a tricky problem to try and solve. It fits entirely naturally into the framework that I've just described. The start state is a randomly selected configuration. The goal state has the numbers in ascending order with the bottom right square empty. The actions are, well, you can move a square left, right, up or down, um, as long as uh, something is going into the empty space. As a result of the fact you have to go into the empty space, it may be that you don't have all four actions available in every state. And the path cost is just one per move, because you want to solve the puzzle in the smallest possible number of moves. But while that's a toy problem, there are many, many examples of uh, much more interesting problems that um, benefit from this kind of approach. I'm not going to talk about these all in detail, um, but perhaps I can say something a little more, bit more about uh, layout in VLSI systems. Um, you now know a little bit about uh, computer architecture and about how a microprocessor is designed, because you've done the digital electronics course. And you've uh, also seen some material in the computer design course. When you go to actually um, manufacture a design for a microprocessor, assuming that you are actually using custom silicon um, and not just uh, writing some kind of um, hardware description language and compiling it onto a, an existing chip, there is a question of how you lay out components in order to get them into the smallest possible die space um, uh, and still uh, obey a whole bunch of different constraints. Now you know, for example, that you need registers and that you need a control unit and that you need an ALU, an arithmetic and logic unit, and that you need a whole bunch of other stuff like caches um, in order to uh, make a microprocessor work. Those have to be laid out essentially in two dimensions on a silicon die, although the layout also has um, numerous layers corresponding to different materials. An example of um, why that might get complicated is that even if you're just going to put a single register in a particular position, it's probably going to need 64 connections going into it and 64 connections coming out. So whenever you place something, you then have to wire it to everything else, and that wiring takes up uh, area um, and has to be rooted in such a way that every wire gets to where it's going, um, in such a way that timing constraints are obeyed because time for propagation down a wire on a, in a VLSI system can be significant. You have to take account of the thermal effect potentially of um, how you've done the placement and ultimately you're trying to find a sequence of placements of subsystems within the microprocessor on to the underlying silicon substrate in such a way that you get everything you need placed, everything is connected together properly, the timing constraints work out, the thermal constraints work out, the rules of the process that's going to be used to do the manufacturing work out, and you get everything within the smallest possible area. Because the bigger area you use uh, the more susceptible you are to defects in the manufacturing process. Okay, so this is a much more um, interesting and significant kind of AI problem that you might solve with this kind of approach. So let's go back to looking at this from the purely algorithmic perspective. We have a start state, um, and in both of the diagrams on this slide, that's the, uh, the state represented as a, as, as a node at the top of the diagram. And in any state, 
we can um, apply uh, an action from the collection of possibilities and that will take us to a new state. So the first distinction that we have to make is whether we're going to think about this procedure um, in terms of building a tree or building a graph. On the left here um, I have the situation uh, illustrating uh, what happens when we think of this search process as a, as, as a tree-based um, algorithm. Um, at each state we can perform one of a number of actions and it takes us to a child state. We can pick up one of the chil children and then we can repeat the process. And at each step uh, we expand this tree a little bit more. On the right uh, I have a diagram showing what happens if we treat this as a graph. In fact a directed, um, possibly cyclic uh, graph in this case. Now the difference is kind of uh, important for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, in a nutshell it's important because um, we implement these two possibilities in a couple of slightly different ways and the basic approaches to, to search that we have um, can act differently depending on which of these uh, um, setups we use. The key point to note is that on the left when we think of this as being a tree, um, an actual state within our search problem can appear in more than one place. Um, only one path can lead to a specific node within the tree, starting from the root, which is the start state for the problem. Um, but a particular state of the problem may appear attached to two or more different nodes. Um, in the case of a graph, uh, we're going to constrain things so that a particular state can only uh, be attached to one node of the graph. The key distinction here is that, well, when, within any real search problem, you're going to be able to get to um, one or more states within that problem via multiple paths, okay, via multiple sequences of actions. And um, in the tree-based uh, setup, we're saying um, that that's possible and we're making those different paths kind of explicit. Um, we're treating each one as a different path through the tree. Now clearly if we take the graph-based um, approach to thinking about these problems, it's very clear indeed that uh, within a, a directed graph we can have cycles. Um, it's pretty easy to find a cycle, in fact more than one cycle, in uh, the, the graph on this slide. Um, there's a cycle here and there's another cycle in here. Um, and that is explicit. It's less obvious in the tree-based uh, version. Um, in that case a cycle will show up because you'll keep hitting um, S over and over, S being some particular state, um, as you go down a particular path starting from the root of the tree and, and progressing down to a sequence of children. Okay, in the graph it's arguably a more compact representation because you can see the, the cycle directly. Okay, but uh, this is two basically just two fundamentally um, complementary ways of thinking about uh, how these search problems work. In both cases we're we're starting at that root node, this is the initial state, and we're looking for a node within the tree or within the graph uh, that, it, that corresponds to one or more potential goals for the search problem at hand. And the uh, sort of important thing here, um, beyond the two different representations, is that in practice clearly um, we could come across either cycles uh, within uh, the problem or we can have um, redundant paths, um, by which I mean that there can be multiple ways to get to some state within the search problem of interest. Now, clearly the fact that any reasonable realistic problem is potentially going to have uh, cycles and or redundant paths um, can make our life more interesting or difficult depending on how you want to look at it. Um, here is a search problem that is uh, very clearly something that we can solve um, in a very straightforward linear manner. Um, but because we have multiple ways of uh, 
getting among um, the nodes, uh, whether we represent this as a tree or a graph, um, the presence of these multiple paths, um, these multiple redundant paths, is taking us from an extremely simple problem to one that's potentially an exponential time one. Okay, so this is uh, th this is one of the fundamental things that makes these problems um, tricky in practice, but there are plenty more which I'm going to come on to. If we think of these problems um, as taking place in the, the tree context, it's very easy to come up with a, a general algorithm for solving them by tree search. We need one more function called expand, and expand just takes an arbitrary state s, and it applies all the actions that are applicable within that state, and gives you back the collection of resulting states. Okay, this, um, once again, I emphasize if you were, uh, during your preparation for um, the Foundations of Computing course, uh, did uh, old exam questions, there are plenty of old OCaml exam questions that involve implementing something along these lines. Okay, so I'm still really rather hoping that you've, that this looks familiar to you. So the, the archetypal tree search algorithm um, works as illustrated in pseudocode here. You start off with a, a collection called the fringe, which initially contains only the start state S0. And now you just loop until either uh, you find a solution or you find there is no solution, or of course you may just keep on searching forever. Within this loop, um, well, everything is fairly straightforward, really. Um, if the fringe becomes empty, then you've exhausted all the possibilities of the search and there is no solution. Um, otherwise, you take some node um, from the fringe. If it's a goal, then you're done. So you return uh, your, your goal state. Um, and alternatively, uh, if you if the thing that you just picked out from the fringe isn't a goal, then you expand it, and you add its children back into the fringe. So this is this is straightforward, and uh, you've seen it before, and hopefully you can remember uh, that you can change the characteristics of how this search works by making the fringe a uh, priority queue and using the priority um, to set what kind of search it is that you're going to be doing. Now, the way that I think you've seen that up until now has been uh, simply um, in the context of either breadth-first or depth-first search, where depending on uh, whether you add expanded, um, or the children of an expanded node to the beginning or the end of the queue, um, you get one or the other search strategies. But there are much more interesting ways in which we can set this priority. And that's where a lot of the cleverness, initially at least, in um, designing algorithms to solve these problems lies. So within a tree, the, uh, the, you can visualize the search as looking a little bit like this. You can divide uh, the nodes within the search tree into three kinds. And here the black nodes are the ones that have been taken from the fringe and expanded. Um, the, the white nodes here are the ones that are currently within the fringe but haven't been expanded yet, and the grey nodes are the ones that are simply as yet uninvestigated. Now, it's a fairly um, trivial exercise to work out how big these search trees can be. If you have a branching factor of b and you end up searching to a depth of d, then the layer at depth d can have b to the power of d states, and the entire tree, well, it's just a geometric sum in order to work out how many um, nodes the tree can have. Okay, and uh, it's an exponential quantity, as we can see here. And we're going to need that um, in order to demonstrate a few things later on.
if you think of this search as taking place within a graph, then things look slightly different. Now we have to um, make sure that no state gets visited more than once, okay? because we want to explicitly construct a graph where each state can only appear within that graph, attached to a node, at most once. And for this we use a thing called a closed list, and the idea is simple. Whenever we see a state, we add it to the closed list. And we don't bother exploring um, anymore uh, if something that we pick out of the fringe has previously been put in the closed list. Okay, So we just keep track of what we've seen and we don't bother re-exploring it. Now this can add um, complications of its own when we try and prove these uh, problems. So one thing I should point out here is that the specific order in which you do things um, within the graph search version can in itself make quite a big difference. Now this is, uh, this is explored a little bit in the problem sheet and is something you can discuss in supervisions. Okay, it's particularly important for A star search, which we're going to come on to in a moment, that you get the ordering correct here. Um, also, there are minor modifications to this uh, pseudocode um, that, that are needed for a couple of the search strategies that we're going to look at. But this is the basic underlying algorithm, and it's pretty similar to what we've just seen, Okay, apart from the fact we're now going to introduce this closed list. So the closed list is initially empty. The fringe initially contains just the start state. Once again, we're going to keep looping. If the fringe is empty, again, that means we've exhausted all the possibilities and there is no solution. Otherwise, we take a state S from the fringe. If it's a goal, we're done. Um, otherwise, if we're still searching, we add it to the closed list to say, OK, we've seen and dealt with this, this state S now. And then for each S prime, which is a child of S, well, we check to see whether um, it's already in the closed list, and we check to see whether it's already in the fringe. And if it's not in either of them, then we add it back into the fringe. Okay, And I think you know that makes sense if you think about it. Um, if you put it into the fringe, it's going to be picked up at some later point, potentially, and expanded. Okay? But if it's already in um, the closed list, that means you've already expanded it sometimes earlier, so you don't want to be expanding it again. And if it's already in the fringe, you don't want to add it in for a second time, because you're going to explore it in a, um, sometime later anyway. Okay, So there's just a couple of little additions here, if we want to treat this thing as a graph. There are a few more points to, to take on board, though. Now, the closed list contains all the um, expanded states that, that uh, we've already seen. Um, you can implement that and would typically probably want to implement that using a hash table, um, which means that the time taken to uh, add or check membership is essentially going to be linear. or oh, sorry, essentially going to be constant. Um, you want a constant time uh, process there when you add things to the closed list or check membership within the closed list um, because as we're going to see this is going to be exponential time anyway even if you do have constant time operations for the closed list so a hash table is almost certainly what you're going to want to use. Um, in the worst case the worst case time and space um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in a moment about uh, time and memory complexity, but I might as well uh, uh, start referring to it here because it's important. Um, the worst case time and space are now proportional to the size of the state space. Um, in any real problem, that's big. I mean, it's going to be huge, and they're both typically going to be exponential um, in the basic parameters of the problem, namely the branching factor and uh, how, how long a... Um, path you need in order to get um, to a solution. Okay, it's going to be typically about b to the power of d um, in, in, for both time and memory. Okay, now I must apologise um, because I've updated the slides for this year and I've just noticed that uh, points four and five here are out of sequence. It is always the way. 
you revise things to make them better, and you always miss something. Sorry about that, I'll come back to the memory and optimality points in a moment. Now hopefully, if you, if you think carefully about what's happening with the graph search version um, here versus the tree search version, you should be able to see that essentially what the graph search version is doing is building a tree within the structure of the graph. Okay, and that's that's what's illustrated here. I have a graph, and the the, the purple uh, edges that have been picked out, the purple directed edges that have been picked out here, illustrate the kind of things that the, the kind of thing that happens when you do search using the graph search approach. And you can see here that those are those directed edges are forming forming a tree within the structure of the graph. And what's more, hopefully it's clear, if you think about this a little, um, that the graph becomes separated in the same sense that the tree does, uh, um, as, I, as I illustrated a couple of slides back. Okay, So the tree here becomes separated into expanded nodes, nodes that are unexpanded but in the fringe, and nodes that are not yet investigated. And hopefully you can see here that basically the same thing then happens within the graph. Um, but more importantly, for our purposes in a few slides time, um, hopefully it's clear here that uh, any path from the start that goes to an unexplored node um, within this graph has to pass through a node that's in the fringe. Okay. This uh, purple tree structure that's being built on the graph once again has nodes that have been expanded, nodes that are in the fringe that are um, unexpanded, and nodes that haven't been um, explored yet. Okay, And we get the same kind of behavior just now imposed on the graph. Okay, So I want you to keep that point in mind, because we're going to need it later. Right? Any path from the start to an unexplored node has to pass through a fringe node. Now, performance. Okay, so we'll try and get back, things back in sequence a little. Um, we're obviously interested in whether a solution gets found, um, but we're almost certainly also interested in whether a solution that we find is a good one in terms of path cost. And in particular, if there are multiple paths that can get us to the same goal state, we want, I think, to know that we're going to get the best one, the one with the shortest path cost. Um, we're also going to want it typically um, to have uh, an algorithm that works well in terms of both time and memory complexity. Okay, so the total cost of finding a solution to one of these problems is something that we can think of in terms of both the path cost of the solution that we get and the cost in terms of time and memory of doing the search. And as I, I think I sort of hinted in the first lecture, um, when I talked about the the sort of wonderful fact that everything you try and do in AI is at least NP hard, um, it may in even in this kind of uh, problem, you know, the, the 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 simplest to conceive possible problem that you can have um, within AI um, for realistic problems of this kind, the um, the the process of finding an optimal solution in the sense of getting one with the best possible path cost can be so um, complex and difficult that you might be willing to settle for a suboptimal solution if you can find it quickly. Okay, This is a perfect example um, of what I said about how sometimes rather than going for the optimal solution um, you'll want to get a pretty darn good one quickly. Okay, and that can very much be the case even within these in this simple context. Now we have two important uh, words here. Completeness. Okay, An algorithm is complete if it guarantees to find you a solution when one exists. And optimality. Okay, An optimal algorithm within this context is one that finds the best solution, always, and the best solution for us means the one with the best path cost. So at this point we've got enough to properly define the um, 
the, the search algorithms that you're already familiar with, okay? When we um, choose a node and expand it, if we add its children to the head of the queue, we end up with depth first search. And if we add them at the tail of the queue, we end up with breadth first search. Um, now in that case, you can actually do the goal uh, test a little earlier. And I want you to think for the purposes of your supervisions about why that is, okay? Because it's, uh, it's important later on. Um, but I'm not gonna dwell on these because they're completely hopeless in practice. Um, and well, it shouldn't be in any sort of uh, um, mystery as to why they're hopeless in practice, although the, the real key issue may surprise you. Um, in some sense, if we look at one of these, let's take breadth first search, uh, it's complete. Okay, that's good. It guarantees to find a solution if one exists because it systematically um, generates all the nodes that you can get to in one step and then all the nodes that you can get to in two steps and so on and so on. Um, and it just keeps spewing out longer and longer paths until it finds a goal. So if it if there's a goal, then it's going to find it, uh, provided that the branching factor is finite, okay? You can conceivably come up with problems like this where you could have an infinite branching factor. Uh, it's unusual, but um, we need that proviso here. Um, is breadth first search optimal? Well, yes, under a moderately tight kind of um, condition, uh, which is that the path cost is a non-decreasing function of node depth, okay? So for example, if all your actions have the same cost, um, it's gonna find an optimal solution um, because all the possible paths to all nodes at depth D um, will have the same cost. So once you hit the depth D that has a goal in it, you're gonna pick that goal and it must be the best one. Um, but we have exponential complexity for both memory and time. And the thing that may surprise you here is that it's memory that is gonna um, trip you up first, okay? Typically, if you try and do this um, using a, an uninformed basic search method like breadth first search, um, you're just gonna fill the memory up. Um, and your machine is going to fall over. And that's going to become a problem long before uh, the time becomes an issue. How about depth first search? Well, if you use the graph search uh, approach to searching depth first, um, it's going to be complete if the number of states is finite. Okay. Um, but not otherwise, okay? Um, and if you use tree search, then because uh, you can potentially have loops that allow repeating actions to um, visit a state uh, multiple times, um, it's not gonna be complete because depth first can then just go whizzing off down one path through the tree and never come back up again. And in neither uh, case is uh, depth first search actually optimal. Okay, so we want optimal and complete algorithms um, and we want ones that are actually feasible to deal with. Um, so breadth first and depth first pretty much fail on both counts. The one thing that is good um, in the case of uh, depth first search is that uh, if we use the tree search version, then we have an improved uh, memory complexity. Um, because we're just going down uh, one branch within the tree, um, we only have to remember on the way the nodes in the current path and the other unexpanded nodes um, are, that were encountered on the way to where we currently are within the search process. So the memory requirement goes down to order BD for branching factor B and depth D. The time complexity is still exponential. Um, for tree search and for graph search, it's, uh, it's the size of the state space, which is probably gonna be exponential as well. Um, and once again, the search isn't necessarily optimal um, and it may not be complete. Uh, so, still not great. Now, one of the 
approaches that you saw um, in the Foundations of Computing course was, of course, uh, the idea of iterative deepening. Um, here, we do depth-first searches, um, and we do it to cutting off at depth one. And if that doesn't work for us, we then repeat and cut off at depth two. And then if that doesn't work for us, we repeat and cut off at depth three. Now, that's kind of um, combining both breadth-first and depth-first search. Um, it's attempting to get the completeness of breadth-first searching in the sense that you generate all the possibilities from the root out to a particular depth, um, but also to get the memory complexity of depth-first searching because you're doing fundamentally a depth-first search. Um, and I think that's a good point at which just to rewind to those two points that I unfortunately had, that I originally had a slightly out of sequence. Okay, so point four here was that um, depth first and interesting deepening search, if you do them with uh, the graph search algorithm, are no longer linear space. Okay, so you can do graph search based uh, depth first searching, but you have to keep the closed list. Okay, so for both depth first and iterative deepening search, if you use the graph searching approach, um, you don't get the memory, uh, the nice memory complexity because you still need to keep the, the closed list. Now, the other, the final point here was on the subject of optimality where you're doing the graph based search. Um, now, here you have to be careful, okay? In the pseudocode for graph space searching, when you find a repeated state, you are only expanding it if it's not in the closed list and it's not already in the fringe. One way to think about that is that when you find a state for the second or third or fourth, however many times, you're discarding it even if it's potentially a better um, solution than the first time you found it, okay? To put that another way, you could, at the first instance of finding a state, find one with quite a high um, path cost. And the second time you find it, it's possible that you will find it with a lower path cost. Okay, But in the straightforward version of graph searching, you are throwing away the second uh, version in any case, okay? You're throwing away um, the state with the shorter path, the lower path cost, um, because you've already seen that state, okay? Even though the first time you saw it, it may have been, a, a, you may have had a worst way of getting there. Now, you can then say, well, how about um, then mo just modifying things so that you keep the better solution, okay? Well, that is a possibility. We're gonna look at that in a second. In fact, we're going to look at something like that immediately. So let's just summarize briefly where we are. Um, you have these uh, these search algorithms that you've seen before, um, but I hopefully, I hopefully now have convinced you that the, the straightforward ways of approaching them are, are, are going to be problematic for a few different reasons, but mainly their memory complexity probably also their time complexity um, and the fact that uh, they may or may not be optimal or complete um, depending on some of the details about uh, how you set them up and whether you are doing breadth first or depth first or iterative deepening and whether you're doing those um, using the fundamentally the tree searching or the graph searching approach. The question then is how do we do this better? Okay, Now the sort of key idea that we need is to come up with a better way of ordering um, our search through the, the space of um, accessible states within the problem. So far, the only thing that these algorithms do is distinguish between a goal state and a non-goal state. Okay? Whether we are doing depth first or breadth first or iterative deepening, we are in a sense ordering 
our exploration of different states in an arbitrary manner. Okay, we're either going down the tree first or across the tree first. What if we could um, set our priority queue okay, for the uh, order in which we um, select things from the fringe to be expanded um, in a more sensible way? Okay, that's, that's the key idea. Now, what might we use to measure the quality of a state? Well, a first suggestion might be um, that because at any point within the search, we can work out the path cost of any of the states that we've got in the fringe, we could maybe try to explore the states in the fringe that have a small path cost first. This is called uniform cost search, okay, when you implement it as using the graph search approach. Um, and it's quite nice and straightforward. It needs a slight modification, which is also needed when we talk about A star search in a moment. Okay, and this is an example of how you might want to arrange things so that when you find a better uh, path to a given state, you then update uh, the, the, the state of your algorithm a little bit to take account of that. The only thing that's been added here is that you do the same check as before. And if a child that you just got from expanding something in the fringe isn't in the closed list and isn't in the fringe, then fine, you just add it into the fringe. Um, but otherwise, if you've decided not to add it directly um, because it's already in the fringe, you do a further check. Okay, so else if here, um, if the fringe contains uh, the child already, um, but it's in the fringe and its path cost is worse than the uh, path that you've used to get to this this new discovery of that same state s prime, then you would replace it in the fringe with your new state s prime. Okay, with the correspondingly lower path cost. Okay, so that's an example of how um, you can modify this uh, in order to try and get some level of optimality back. And in fact, this is enough um, for uniform cost search to make it optimal. Okay, so here we Im immediately have a win. Um, and the reason for that is that whenever we select a node, within uniform cost search, it must be the one that's got the shortest path to that node. And you should spend just a moment um, thinking about why that is, okay? Um, and if it's not uh, something that you can um, infer just at the moment, then think about it again after we've looked at a star search because it's essentially a very similar argument. Um, this search process is also complete, um, provided you can't get stuck inside an infinite path. Okay. Now, you can introduce two conditions to make sure that that can't happen. Um, the first is that you can require all the costs for individual actions to have at least some minimum value epsilon. Okay. The reason for that is that um, it's possible to construct uh, search problems where path costs um, will, for example, uh, develop as uh, a cost of one and then a cost of a half and then a cost of a quarter and then a cost of an eighth and so on. And when you sum these up, well, the uh, the path cost then converges to two. But if your, opti your, if your optimal goal actually has a cost of slightly greater than two, um, that you can... Uh, get to another way, um, then here you can potentially get, got, get stuck on an infinite path because you just keep uh, doing more and more actions that are less and less costly and uh, you get stuck in that part of the search. Um, the second thing you need is uh, a finite branching factor. Okay, So again, you can't just get stuck um, dealing with a node that's got an infinite number of children. Uh, that stops you progressing uh, to other areas within the search space. So what does this give us? Well, it's a step in the right direction. 
Um, what we have now is uh, something that's optimal and complete. Um, but it doesn't still tend to give us enough improvement to be something that's usable in practice. Um, so think of this as, as a stepping stone. Think of uniform cost search as a stepping stone. Um, and what it teaches us is that the idea of evaluating states in a more sensible way so that we, well, hopefully can choose states to expand um, in, in a sensible way that kind of pushes us on towards uh, part of the graph or the tree where our solution lives um, is, is a good thing to do, okay? So, the next question is, um, can we think of a better evaluation function? And uh, the answer, hopefully unsurprisingly, is yes, we can. What we need now is the concept of a heuristic. Um, we just tried using the path cost as a way of choosing good nodes to expand, good states to expand. Um, the problem with using path cost is it only tells you how much it costs to get to where you currently are. Um, but it's not directed towards a goal. Um, what we want to do really is pick states in such a way that we're likely to pick states that get us that, that allow us to make progress towards a goal. Okay. Um, it may be that we can make an action that significantly increases our path cost, but makes up for that by getting us to a goal in one step, okay, or to the penultimate step, one step away from a goal. Um, so we need something that's more directed in in the sense that it it, it, it allows us to pick states that are that are going to get us somewhere in the search process, not just keep us on short current paths. So a heuristic function is something that estimates the cost of the best path from some arbitrary state that we may have got to, S, to a goal. Okay? Um, and it has one extra constraint that if S is actually a goal, then H of S, the heuristic for that state, is always going to have to be zero, which kind of makes sense. Okay, so within the search, we can visualize what's happening according to this diagram. Okay, we'll have searched within our tree or within our graph. We'll be interested in a current path to where we've got to. Where we've got to is the state S. Um, and we know P of S, which is how much it's cost us to get there. Okay, and that's what we'll be using for uniform cost search. H of S now estimates how far away the nearest goal is. Now, here is um, one of AI's dirty little secrets. H of S tends to be something that, because it is problem dependent, okay, uh, the way in which you construct this function H is going to depend very heavily on the characteristics of the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, as a result, you have to design it either by using expert knowledge about the problem or by some other means. Okay, so um, AI is not yet at the point where we can just set it going and hope that it will do wonderful things. In order to make uh, algorithms, even for these simple problems, effective, you need a good heuristic. And the chances are that designing that heuristic um, is going to be something that an expert human has to do. It is possible to approach the design of a heuristic H um, using machine learning. That's not a new idea. It has been around for decades. Um, uh, and there is a big body of work that tries to do that. Um, but machine learning requires human input as well, believe it or not. So... This is important, okay? The better your heuristic age is, 
the better your search algorithm is likely to perform. And age is probably going to need some human input, possibly quite a lot of human input. Um, and even if you can try and design it by learning methods or other methods within AI or within computer science, um, those are probably going to need some human input as well. Okay, so uh, that, that's, a, that's a critical matter. Here is an example. Um, a typical search problem would be root finding. Um, here you have places on a map and uh, there are paths or roads between them and you want to get from your start position to a goal position and you want to minimize uh, the actual distance that you then have to travel. How might you design a heuristic um, in this case? Well, if I'm at some particular place on a journey and uh, I want a rough estimate of how far away the, my, my goal destination is, I could just take the distance as the crow flies. Okay, I don't necessarily want to get my map out and start uh, trying to measure exactly how long all the um, the curvy roads are, I could just take an estimate which is the straight line distance between where I am and where I want to be. And that's illustrated um, in the diagram here. On the left we have this, the, uh, the direct distances, the straight line distances. On the right we have some suitably curvy roads uh, that would give the actual um, costs of uh, choosing to the action that corresponds to going by those roads. Now, the accuracy is obviously going to depend on what the roads are really like. Um, this will be more or less uh, accurate depending on the nature of the actual roads. Um, but it's, as a rule of thumb, okay, as a, as a quick estimate, um, it seems pretty reasonable. So can we use H as our um, means of deciding which state in the fringe to expand next? Well, yes, we can. Um, but again, it tends not to work that well, okay? We still need to go one better than, uh, than using the heuristic. We can still do better than using just the heuristic. And this kind of gets us to the, the initial point that we really want to be at, because this gets us to the concept of what's going to be a star search algorithm, and this is the archetypal, key, central, um, fundamental, foundational um, search algorithm for, for AI, okay? It is of great historical significance, and it is the basis for... A whole bunch of other things. So A star search just uses a simple trick, really. Um, we know the path cost P of S, which tells us the cost of getting to where we are. Um, and now we've introduced the idea of a heuristic that estimates how far we have left to go. So why don't we just add them together? And that gives us F of S, which is an estimated cost for a path that goes through S. And it's just the sum of the current path cost for S and the heuristic for S, estimating how far we are from the goal. Okay? Now, A star search using either the tree searching or the graph searching approach simply means that we're going to use F cost, F of S, um, to decide which state to take from the fringe next and expand. Okay? We're going to preferentially expand states S with a low F cost, F of S. Now this is nice um, because it's optimal and complete under some fairly simple conditions and it can be vastly superior to the naive um, search methods like breadth first, depth first, iterative deepening and so on. Okay, so this is, this is the first sort of really key um, slide, I guess. Uh, A star search just uses F cost um, to choose which nodes to expand. The question then is what sort of um, simple conditions do we need um, to make this approach optimal and complete? Well, first of all, we need the idea of an admissible heuristic. Okay, an admissible heuristic is one that never overestimates um, the cost that it's estimating, okay? never overestimates the cost from where we are to where 
and there is gold that is. Okay, now that's great um, for the earlier example of using straight line distance uh, within a root finding problem. The straight line distance is the shortest distance, um, or the shortest that the distance could possibly be. So it's certainly never going to overestimate the relevant cost. So that's an admissible heuristic. Um, and in practice, um, admissibility is something that you're going to have to design in to your heuristic. Okay. Once again, taking on board the fact that the chances are um, that coming up with a heuristic for a specific uh, problem that you might be interested in is going to be something that has to have some human input. Uh, making sure that it's admissible is something that's going to fall typically to the human. Okay. But the nice thing about admissibility is that it's enough to show that um, A star based on tree search is optimal. And that's fairly easy to, um, to demonstrate. Uh, so here, well, we have precisely the, the demonstration that we want. Here we're doing uh, A star search using the tree search approach. Um, and we can argue uh, that this will always find an optimal goal when there is a uh, when it's possible to find a goal, um, and we can argue by a fairly straightforward redu reductio ad absurdum. So, to set this up, um, goal opt is going to be an optimal goal state. Okay, this is the guy that we're looking for. Um, and its f cost, which will be equal to its path cost, because the heuristic has to be zero when we get to a goal, um, and its its cost will be f opt. Okay, so f of goal opt is f opt. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, What we want to show is that we'll always find that before we find any suboptimal goal. Okay. Now, in order to find a suboptimal goal, which in this case is goal two, goal two would have to be in the fringe and selected. Okay, because the first thing we do after we select something from a fringe is test to see if it's a goal. So to have suboptimality, it would have to be possible to, for goal two to be in the fringe and to be selected before we got far enough along in the search to find goal opt. Okay, so we just need to demonstrate that the search can never select goal two, in this case from the fringe, and it's in the fringe because it's next to one of the white nodes. Um, and if we can demonstrate that uh, the search process can never select it before it gets as far as finding goal opt, then we've shown that uh, for an admissible heuristic, A star tree search is optimal. And that's then fairly straightforward. Um, so let's say that S is a state in the fringe and it's on a path to goal opt. Okay. So that would be a state like this one. This state is currently in the fringe, and it's on the way to where the optimal goal is. So, we know that f opt is bigger than or equal to fs. F opt is bigger than or equal to Fs. Because the path cost is increasing, okay, and the H measurement always underestimates how far away the nearest goal is. Okay, so the value of F opt is exact. At Fs, we know the path cost to S, and we know H of S, which always underestimates the remaining distance. Okay, so that's where we get this inequality from. 
Now, all we have to do is say, well, imagine that goal 2 is chosen for expansion before S is. Okay? In order to cho choose goal 2 and find that goal before the optimal one, we'd have to choose goal 2 before we choose goal uh, before we choose S, okay, because we're going to pick something from the fringe and expand it, and we'd have to pick goal 2 first. That could only happen because we're choosing things on the basis of small f cost in order to expand them if f2, which is the cost of the suboptimal goal, okay. It only happen if the cost of the suboptimal goal is less than or equal to f of s. And if we put those two inequalities together, we've established that the f cost of the optimal goal is greater than or equal to the f cost of the suboptimal goal. But that would mean that the optimal goal is not optimal. Okay, so we have a contradiction there. Okay, so that's hopefully, you know, pretty pretty straightforward. Okay, that's just a fairly direct proof that all we need to show that tree search A star is optimal is that the uh, heuristic is admissible, meaning it always underestimates the distance to the nearest goal. For A star graph search, the situation is slightly trickier. And once again, that's because um, graph search in its, uh, its most straightforward form okay, can discard an optimal route if that route isn't the first one generated. All right, so just go back and look at uh, uniform cost search again, okay, because I g gave an argument there um, as to why you might want sometimes to do replacements of states within the fringe. Okay? It's a very closely related issue. Okay. But the point with graph search is that um, if it finds a state twice, then it discards uh, the one it found by the second possible path, regardless of whether that path was better or not. Um, and for that reason, for A star graph search, we need a slightly stronger condition on the heuristic. Okay. Now we can do this by trying to keep only the least expensive path um, and updating things, but that's extra work and it's messy and uh, the extra sort of bit of uh, condition that we need on the heuristic is so benign that um, it seems like a, a much nicer way of dealing with it. Now the trick here is that uh, this little extra condition forces us to find the best path to a repeated state first. Okay, And the uh, condition is called monotonicity. Um, now, monotonicity implies admissibility. It is a stronger condition. And all it says is that your f costs should be increasing as you go along a path between the start and the goal. Okay, so um, if h is admissible uh, and f of s is the sum of the path cost and h of s, um, we're kind of expecting that as you go along a path between the start state and the goal, the uh, the h value decreases because each time you go along a step, you hopefully get closer to where the goal is, and so the distance left to go gets less. Um, here I've kind of illustrated what's going on and just plugged some reasonable looking numbers in. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is is very simple. I'm simply trying to illustrate the fact that the path cost is increasing. You kind of expect the heuristic to be decreasing. And uh, that can give you a situation where your f cost decreases when you go from one state to another. Okay? Now that's the thing that we want to avoid. Okay, so mo a monotonic heuristic is one where the f cost is always um, non strictly increasing. Okay? f of s prime is greater than or equal to f of s when we go from s to s prime. Okay, that's the condition that we need. 
And in fact, it turns out that it's uh, kind of equivalent to a version of the triangle inequality. The heuristic is monotonic if and only if it obeys this expression, okay, which looks like the triangle inequality. Um, it is an exercise in the problem sheet for you to prove that uh, heuristic is monotonic if and only if it obeys this version of the triangle inequality. So have fun with that. Okay, so if you have a monotonic heuristic, that is enough um, to make a star search with the graph search algorithm also um, optimal. Now, hopefully, um, the fact that this uh, conception of monotonicity is so closely related to, to the triangle inequality, and that's so fundamental in terms of how distances have to work, um, hopefully that's enough to convince you that it's a sensible condition. Um, let me just briefly try and give you another argument that it's a sensible condition. Um, taking the, the, the previous example of how something can be made to be not monotonic, if you think about it, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Um, the fact that here f of s is 9 tells us that the cost of a path through s is at least 9. Okay, because h is admissible. Okay, it always underestimates. Um, but then s prime is on a path that goes through s. <laughs> so if the cost of a pass through a path through s has to be at least nine, um, it doesn't make any sense to have it suddenly go down to seven. Okay, think about it that way, and monotonicity does seem like a, a very natural kind of thing to to want to impose. Now, we can now argue that a star graph search is optimal, and actually that follows um, quite simply. If the values of f of s along a path are non-decreasing and you're using f of s um, to order the way in which you pick nodes to expand from the fringe, um, if you come to uh, a situation like the one I've shown here in the diagram, you have um, f of s and f of s prime must be greater than or equal to f of s and is in the fringe, you can't actually deal with s prime until everything that has a smaller f cost than s prime has been dealt with. Okay? That means that everything with an f cost that's less than the f cost of an optimal goal gets explored. And then one or more goals with the optimal f cost gets found. Okay? It's kind of obvious. I hope you can convince yourself that this is that this is how it works out. Okay? You have because f cost is increasing along a path, you have to explore everything um, with an f cost that's less than the f cost of an optimal goal, and then you'll get to find a goal, and because you'll find it before anything with a greater f cost, you have to get the optimal one first. Okay, so that's all really nice. It's also complete, provided, uh, and once again we have these um, these two conditions. You've got a finite branching factor, and there's a finite positive constant epsilon. It's a lower bound on the cost of an action. Okay, and the argument there is exactly the same as before. You don't want a f an infinite branching factor because that can get you stuck in uh, one part of the search, search space and uh, unable to escape from it in order to find an actual goal. And you don't want to be able to construct infinitely long paths um, with an increasing uh, f-cost that converges to something that's uh, smaller than the f-cost of a, an optimal goal. Now, I'm not going to prove the following things about complexity. Um, as you can probably guess, talking about the complexity of A-star search now becomes a little bit trickier 
because uh, the heuristic uh, is, and the quality of the heuristic in particular is, is likely to have a very strong effect on how long it takes uh, to do a search here. So I'm not going to prove these things, but I'm just going to note them for you. Okay, A star search has a property called optimal efficiency, which means that there's no other optimal algorithm that works by constructing paths from the root that can guarantee to examine fewer nodes. Unfortunately, though, um, that's not enough in many cases still um, to make this a, a fully usable algorithm. Okay. It still has exponential time complexity in most cases. And unfortunately, because it um, in the graph search case, it still stores all the nodes it generates. It once again has exponential memory um, complexity, and memory again becomes a problem before time. So, what can we do about that? Well, there are several things we can do about that. The first of those is to look at iterative deepening A star search, which I'm going to go on to next. However, I will just point something out um, before I, I move on to IDA star. These kinds of search problems are so common um, and so difficult to solve in many cases uh, that this is an ongoing and currently still active area of research. If you look at a, a journal such as Artificial Intelligence, which is one of the more prominent uh, AI, um, or one of the more prominent venues for publishing AI research, you find that algorithms are still being developed for these kinds of problems. Um, and the space within which you can develop algorithms for this kind of problem is a very large one. What we're now going to move on to is looking at um, how you can get around uh, the problem of needing exponential memory. Um, and there are an enormous number of trade-offs that you can make, as you're about to see, um, in terms of doing that. And as a consequence, this is actually still a very active field. But it's not as fashionable as deep learning, but it's still a really active field to work in, and there are still interesting things to be done.